Two of my least favorite topics today, guys. The end and the judgment. How exciting. And I'll tell you why they are my least favorite. That around these two topics, good, solid Christian men and women fight and tear each other to shreds over the doctrine of the end times and what the judgment to come may look like. And so I almost had Jessica sign, uh, have you all sign a little waiver as you came in today that said you would leave your tomatoes at the door. You're not going to lynch me after the message today that we can still love each other even after we talk about this. So commit in your hearts, Delon, to still love me after today. Thank you. So the two questions that I want to look at together, one And Jennifer threatened this at the very beginning. She said, I'm going to put down eschatology. And that's the study of the end times. And she did. She said, is it the Christian hope or just something we hope goes our way? Something we just hope about. And the question, another question that uh, really is married to it is what is the coming judgment going to be like? I just, the person who wrote this question said, just a glimpse of what the process will be. And what is our hope for a glorious afterlife? Ah, now that part, that part of the question we can love. So we'll end on a note that we can all agree on, but by then we'll all be too mad to listen anymore. That'll be okay. (laughs) So if you'll turn in your scriptures, either one in the pew or the one that you brought with you, to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, you might... Put on your endurance. Scripture says we need to have endurance. We're just going to read the whole thing. Um, A little background here. Jesus has finally come to Jerusalem. And he, he went to the temple. He drove out the money changers. He's become angry with the way that they are doing the work of the temple. And he's leaving. And as he's leaving the temple, now this should cue in our minds like, In Ezekiel, the glory of God departing the temple. Here's the Holy of Holies leaving and saying they won't see him again until the time comes when they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the end of chapter 23. And his disciples are are convinced that maybe Jesus didn't catch the full splendor of the temple. And so they have to direct his attention back to it. And they're like, Jesus, maybe you didn't catch it. Maybe you didn't see how cool it was, because truly it was probably, in all honesty, one of the grandest sights in the ancient world, right in in that area. It would have been amazing. Gleaming white, gold on the inside, just astounding to look at. And And his disciples were excited to finally get to Jerusalem and see it. And then Jesus is unimpressed. And this is what ensues. Matthew Chapter 24. As Jesus left, he was going out of the temple. His disciples came up and called his attention to its buildings. He replied to them, Do you see all these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of labor pains. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted, and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. The many will fall away, betray one another, and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to the nations, and then the end will come. So, when you see the abomination of desolation 
spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his coat. Woe to the pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray that your escape may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For at that time there will be a great distress. The kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. Unless those days were cut short no one would be saved. But those days will be cut short because of the elect. If anyone tells you then, see, here is the Messiah, or over here, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Take note, I have told you in advance. So, if they tell you, see, he's in the wilderness, don't go out, or see, He's in the storerooms. Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the people of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds and of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding grain with a hand mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore be alert since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. You know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why you also are to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whew, we made it. So we read that. I almost feel like Jesus didn't answer the question. He gave all of those things, but he said, the disciples asked at the start, what is the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. When will these things happen? And he gives them a series of rather ambiguous things to watch out for. War, rumors of war, people claiming to be the Christ. Things that have happened for all history. Since Christ died and rose again, these things have occurred. He gave one clear sign to watch out for. He says, here's how you'll know the Son of Man is returning when he appears in the sky and you see him with your eyes. 
<laughs> pretty clear. Pretty good. So, with all that in mind, I have three questions I want us to focus on today. One is, how should we think about the end times? How should we think about them? Two, where should we keep our focus? And three, why should we be comforted by judgment? When we get to judgment, we're going to jump over to Revelation chapter 20. So have your thumb marked at the end of the book. We'll get there in about 15 minutes or so. Let's talk first about how we should think about the end times. Jesus gives us some imagery to fill our heads with. We have pregnancy imagery, labor pains. The end, there'll be upheavals, there'll be pain, there'll be a process leading up to the birth, which Jesus doesn't talk about, but the full term of these labor pains is the appearing of Christ, which will come at a time unexpected. So we have thief in imagery. Be alert, you don't know when the thief will break into your house, so you have to watch out for him in the same way Jesus will return suddenly when we don't expect it. It's almost as if he's mocking those who would dare make a date prediction. There's been like, if you look back, there's been over 200 some date predictions, which is like one a decade since Christ died. One a decade. Someone said, Alvin, I know. It's going to be November 12th. 2030. And when someone says that, you can say, okay, I can check that date off. <laughs> I'm sure that won't be it. There was really a funny guy not too long ago. He wasn't trying to be funny. He was a horrible thief, but he said, hey, look, the rapture's going to happen, and who's going to take care of your stuff? Cindy? So you give me all your money, and I'll take care of it Well, then when the rapture happens, okay? And the first question should have been, why are you not going to be a part of the rapture? <laughs> Where are you going to be, man? Anyway, we have everyday life imagery. They'll be marrying, giving in marriage, eating, drinking. Life is going to go on normally until suddenly it's not normal anymore. And we have lightning imagery. We have suddenly, visibly, unmistakably, Somehow, in the eyes of every man, woman, and child alive, we will see. There's lightning across the sky, you will see it. So let's just parse through some of this stuff. Let's begin in verses 1 and 2 of Matthew 24. The glory of God departing the temple, setting the stage for all that is to come. What the disciples do is a good indicator for us. Jesus is there in front of them, and they look at the temple, and they say, look at how wonderful and glorious it is. Jesus was looking at the temple. He had just called them den of thieves, robbers, worthless men. That's the heart of the temple, because they were, they were robbing folks. They were corrupt. But the disciples saw the gleaming exterior and said, isn't it wonderful? And they wanted to see how Jesus to see how great it was. But he cut straight to the heart of the matter. He said, do you see these things? When we consider end times things, we must not get caught up in pretty language, elegant philosophies, I believe at the end of all things, God will look at our best laid plans to understand the end and say, do you see all these things? That doesn't matter. I matter. That's what Christ says. I matter. Focus on me. And that's the whole thesis of the message today. If we focus on Christ, all Order will be accomplished. Every good thing will be put in place. And we will perhaps be left going, well, I still have questions like the disciples. We are going to go as far as Christ discussed and no farther. So, as we, as we proceed, I just want you to have that anticipated disappointment in your mind. So when the letdown comes, Alvin, maybe it'll be more gentle for you. 
Everything that does not have its total bedrock on Christ is completely doomed to be toppled over, stone from stone. Not one thing will remain. So let's look at verses 3 to 8. Famine, war, rumors of war, false messiahs, simply signs that the end is coming sometime. It's on its way at some point. The only thing that Jesus tells us to do is he says, watch out and don't be deceived. You, if you can put that somewhere in your brain space, write it on your hand, uh, write it in your Bible, this is, these are two vital declarations for us Christians. Watch out and don't be deceived. Watch out for what? That's what verse 15 through 28 is going to get into. The watch out for who? People who say the Messiah has come. There's some cults who say, I think it's the Mormons. He came secretly. He came secretly in the 1900s, and now he's secretly engaging in his thousand-year reign. We would say he's not doing a good job. He didn't come secretly. This... Scripture will always debunk and refute those who claim a portion of the truth. Go to your Bibles. Stick with them. Watch out. There are so many philosophies, there's so many things that could cause us to get our lives hung up on things that are not the bedrock of Christ. Last week, or a couple weeks ago, we got to talk about angels. A wonderful, awesome, and cool topic. In fact, people love, there's a whole category, they call it angelology and demonology. That's even scarier, right? We want to talk about demons. Who are they? Where did they come from? What's their rank and order like? No, oh, that's not Christ. Focus here. Keep your eyes off of those things. There's lots of things we can get caught up in in our curiosity. Don't be deceived. People will come and try to teach all sorts of things, and people have believed it throughout history. Every time somebody says, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah, there's a guy in North Korea right now who says he is Christ returned, and he has a disciple following around him. People saying, he's it. Jesus came back as this North Korean guy. It's absurd. It's madness. But... The more we are inclined to want to know all the answers, the more that we will be deceived when someone says, I have them all. And for the low, low price of $9.99, <laughs> you too can have all the answers. My dad remembers when he was in college, there was a guy who, he would send out these brochures that said, if you send me $10, I'll send you back a business plan guaranteed to make you a million dollars. So he was back in college, and he said, man, it's only 10 bucks. I can do that. So he sent it in, and the guy sent him back. It was just one little piece of paper that said, create a promotion like this. <laughs> that was it. All right. <laughs> There's always somebody who's going to want to take you in and get what you have. In fact, isn't that one of the accusations against the church? They say, oh, churches just want your stuff. They just want your money. They just want you to believe what they believe. They just want power and authority. God forbid. All authority and power belongs to Christ. And if anybody in the room is concerned that the church only wants you here for your money, and we say keep it, you know? It's not worth a bad look for the church for us to come out begging or needing or desiring all we desire is you because you're precious to god and we love you we're not trying to win converts to a theology other than christ there was a guy he was going he's going to church in connection bell Fouche now but he was going to this another church over in spearfish and they wouldn't let him be a leader in the church because he had a different view of the rapture than the leaders there. And so they said, oh, 
You know, you can't do anything. You can't teach kids. You can't count money. You, nothing. Faithful Christian man. We don't want converts to a, a theory. We want converts to Christ and Christ alone. How do we protect ourselves from deception? How do we stay on high alert as Christians so that the end of all things can become our hope and not our preoccupation? We need to have strong spiritual disciplines. You need to have a great prayer life. In Sunday school today, we talked about how Jesus knew the plans of God. It seemed he had a perfect understanding, the man Jesus, of everything God wanted him to do. How did he get that understanding? Is it because he was himself God? Well, in Philippians, we're told that he set aside equality with God while he was here on earth. He had the fullness, but he spent almost every waking hour in prayer. If he was not doing the ministry, he was seeking God and his will and his purpose. If you and I took Paul's advice and prayed continually, we would have a pretty good idea of what God wanted us to do. If we had Jesus' habit of fasting, of prayer, of synagogue and scripture reading, we would not have to ponder aloud, I wonder what the purpose of my life is. I wonder what I was born for. God would say, you, I have works created before the foundation of the world that have been waiting for you. Isn't that warm, heartwarming? John, isn't that amazing? For you, works before the foundation of the world. And if we let different ideas or different preoccupations cut in and get in the way, we're never going to get there. So we have to endure to the end. So, Verses 9 to 14. This is a difficult verse. If we come back here and look at this. Verse 13, look at that with me. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures to the end will be saved. There's going to be persecutions, false prophets. You're going to be hated. Folks aren't going to like you because you're a Christian. And this is difficult for me as a people person with a people-pleasing nature. I, I struggle with that. I am at close, this close to being guilty of the accusation of having no rudder, just a blow with the winds of approval, if not for the foundation and the bedrock that I have here. I would have no hope. I would just blow along like a tumbleweed. But God gives me grounding. To him who endures to the end will be saved. If you're in track and field and you sign up for the 100-yard dash, Dave, and you make it 95 and walk off, what kind of medal do you get? Not much. I don't even know if they give you a participation prize for that one, Sean. <laughs> maybe. Maybe today they would. You tried hard. Here's your quitter ribbon. We still love you. You have to cross the finish line. Eschatology is about not giving up. It's our hope. He is coming back, and he will judge the living and the dead, and he will pass out rewards, and he will pass out judgments. Eschatology is hope because the pain and the burden of this life is not forever. Amen? I mean, let's get excited about that for a second. The pain and the burden is not forever. Even if the only relief that comes is at the end of our earthly walk, we know that it has ended forever for those of us who have trusted in Christ. It's about accepting the easy yoke of Jesus and remembering to take heart because he has overcome the world. I'm coming back, he said. And Peter says he's not slack concerning his promises as some consider slackness. You might say, man, it's been 2,000 years. How much longer do we have to walk? How much more do we have to take? Our job while we wait is to keep our love warm 
verse 12, because of lawlessness, because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. What is Jesus saying there? You're going to look at the world and say, man, it's stinky. I can't, I can't comprehend where God is. And so I'm done. I walk away. I hand in my chips at the 95-yard line because I can't see him in all of this. Because of lawlessness. How do you keep your love warm? How do you have a nice, soft heart in the midst of a harsh and gross world? If you have the answer, you come on up, Doug. That's all right. (laughs) I'll tell you what. It's a strong Christian community. It's people to lean on and who will lift you up. It's to remember that whatever burdens you have, you don't have to bear them alone. That's Satan's scheme. That's one of the tools in his toolbox is to isolate you like a vicious wolf. Get that weak one off so he can devour it. Whereas that herd, they're safe, there's protection. You know why the zebras have stripes when they're all together? It looks like one big, massive animal to the predators. They can't get in there. They can't see the individual because of the herd. That's you, church. You're the herd, and that roaring lion wants to peel you off one by one and devour you and to say, you're, it, you're alone. Don't call the pastor. He doesn't care. Don't call your friends. It's, it's 3 a.m. They're not interested. That's the lie of Satan where the truth of God says you are one. One body, one blood, one baptism, one faith, and one Father. Don't ever give in to that deception. Our future hope mandates endurance through this horrible life. So use this network. Here it is for you. Stay in a strong commitment to obedience. When I get depressed, when depression falls on me, the number one thing that lifts me up is to remember I have work to do and to go out and do it. And suddenly, it's not quite as bleak as it was. It's stunning to walk in obedience. Charles Spurgeon, one of the great preachers of the 1800s and of our generation, was horribly depressed. His wife would come into his study and he would be He was a big dude, so imagine this. He would be curled up under his desk sobbing because he couldn't handle his burdens. But his wife would pick him up, hold him, put him back into his chair and push him back up and say, there's work to be done. There's no time for that. Church, there's work to be done, right? There's no time to be getting off track. And we have hope. Look at this in verse 14. Despite all of that, the false prophets, the persecutions, the false messiahs, the pain and the ugliness of this world, the good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to every nation. Amen. Can we we get an amen for that? Be Pentecostal with me for a minute. This is amazing. In spite of all of that, God's word prevails. And it will prevail until the end. On our Facebook page, we got a, we've gotten a lot more activity on it lately, and a lot of it's kind of ugly. Uh, the comments, we have to hide a lot, delete a lot. People actually cursing, using foul language, being ugly on there. Um, but one of the comments that caught my eye is, how can people still believe this crap in 2023? It's like, oh, I believed it in 2022 as well. I'll probably believe it in 2024 also, Alvin. All things in good order. The year doesn't matter. The times don't matter. All that matters is that you hold on tight. And we keep proclaiming and we take part in it all the way to the end. Go to verse 29 to 31. The sign of Jesus' return is almost humorous in its culmination, as we already talked about. The sign he has returned or will return is that he has returned. You see him. Boom. Suddenly it's there. And this is the only sign that is given that would be verifiable. Because there's war right now. There's more rumors of war coming. 
There's pestilence and persecution all across the world. But until Jesus returns, we carry on. Scriptural truth is all that we can hold on to. Alvin said it great. We bend our knee to the word which was given by the word. Our Lord Jesus Christ. God breathed all of it. So in verse 34, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now let's, I'm going to zoom out of, of preaching and we're going to move into a historical talk here just real quick. So hold on for a little whiplash. It's all right. Um, what is he talking about? Because that generation all has died. And all of this stuff has not come to pass. So is Jesus a false prophet? We need to deal with this quickly before we can move on in our presentation here today. All of this, Matthew 24, is an interweaving of timely prophecy for the disciples and long-term prophecy for us. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D., the temple torn down, stone from stone. All that's left is what they call the wailing wall that Jews go to. They just have one portion of the wall left. And where the temple was now is the, uh, the Muslim Dome of the Rock. Thank you. This gen that generation did not pass away until all that Jesus said was fulfilled. The temple destroyed. The People of that time, the Christians of that time who had Jesus' words, they went out to the caves when they saw the Roman army coming. They did not go back to the city. They went out and they were spared. Those who fled to Jerusalem for protection were all destroyed, all killed. We have a historical record of this. The truth on display. So we have the local fulfillment. And then we have this generation speaking of all this, all the people who live in this current age, this current era. Jesus said this generation broadly will not pass away until all these things take place, which is culminated in his return, ushering in the new era. So Jesus cannot succumb to the claim or criticism of being a false prophet. These things truly did take place so let's talk about where should we keep our focus so how should we think about the end times we should think about it in terms of hopefulness in terms of suddenness that we need to be watchful and be wary and keep our eyes solely fixed on christ so where should we keep our focus we should keep it on be ready and don't worry verse 36 nobody knows the day or the hour, not the angels, isn't this weird, and not the sun. God didn't reveal that to Jesus. He just knew that it would happen, and he had an idea of the timeline. Only the Father. And verse 46, Blessed is the servant the master finds working when he returns. He's going to come suddenly at a day you don't expect, so work. Work like little children whose dad might walk in the door at any time and see that dirty house you left. And they said, clean your room, and you didn't. He's going to be mad. <laughs> we need to go and do the work, do the labor. Matthew 6, Jesus said, let tomorrow worry about itself. Could we apply this ultimately into eschatological terms? Let the very distant tomorrow which could be today, worry about itself. Worry about today. And this is the exact same teaching here. Work while you can. Love God while you're able. Be His good servants while it's within your grasp to do so. Claim His name before it's too late. Because pretty soon all things will be washed away and the new will come. And when that happens... The decision-making window will be closed. It will be too late. Whatever you've done or not done, it's history. Eternal history. So labor while you can. 
We can't figure out the details of the end. If it was easy, there wouldn't be two dozen philosophies at your fingertip. A rapture before a great tribulation. A rapture in the middle of the tribulation. A rapture after. No tribulation at all. Jesus just appearing. Brave and brilliant men and women have grasped each of these philosophies as it carries them along. And I know that it's irritating sometimes that I don't grab onto one and, and preach it from the pulpit. But my official pastoral philosophy is just this. Live each day as if God will return right now. And if you do that, then what our executive director of the DBC says will be true. He says, about the end times, I'm a pantheist. I believe everything will pan out in the end. <laughs> And whatever you hold on to, whichever one you grab, I'm not throwing stones, I'm not disparaging any viewpoint here today, whichever one you grab on to, make it fit the framework of what Christ said. He said, expect to be persecuted. So if your end times framework says, I don't expect any persecution, I expect to be removed from all trouble and trial, your framework is wrong because it's not submitted to Christ. If you use your end times framework as a judge of who's a good or a bad Christian, your framework is wrong because it doesn't give the foundation to Christ. It gives it to your philosophy. Submit to Christ in all things. And then as you piece together how to work out your faith, everything will be in good order. So, I see that I've preached far too long on these things, and I still have one point left. Allow me to read, if you would bless me with five more minutes of your indulgence, read with me Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. As you find that, just an aside, if you attend Black Hills Baptist Church, it would be my great honor if you always called the book Revelation in the singular and you didn't put an S on it. That would make your pastor really happy. That would be really great. All right, now that we are all there, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is judgment, judgment day, the great white throne, all those, those living, those dead, standing before God, all raised. There's a, there's a universal resurrection. There's a universal resurrection, and everybody will stand before the throne. Now, the question said, give us a glimpse of what that process will be like. I can't do that. I can't. I'm unable. Can you imagine God on his throne and all of humanity, past and present, before him? Wow, what a sight. There's an assumption there's been something like 120 billion people in all human history, 120 billion folks standing before God in the great heavens. It's amazing. If you want a higher glimpse of this judgment in the last, read the last three chapters of Revelation. It's stunning. It's amazing. The new Jerusalem that comes down, the new heaven, the new earth, all before God. Death and Hades judged, hell judged, cast into the lake of fire, along with all those whose names are not written in the book of life. The second death. All resurrected and all parted out to the left and to the right, we are told. 
those who are given over to eternal judgment and those who are given over to eternal glory. This is what the scripture says. And then a completely new creation established. Just a quick note, you know, heaven is not the eternal home for the Christian. It's on new earth. It's the new earth that is created where we are brought, where the new Jerusalem comes, where God will come and reside again with his people. Isn't that an exciting thought? Where he says, I'll wipe away every tear. Joy eternal. Just imagine eternal joy. Alvin and I sometimes talk and we say, isn't the idea of eternal life like boring? Anybody get a little worried? Like, won't heaven be kind of dull? In the presence of the great and glorious God, how could we even imagine such a thing? If it truly is an eternal present, your best you, in a new and glorious body, Paul says it's like a seed that turns into wheat, so will your new body be different from that seed that was planted. This is the seed, then you will be the wheat we can't even think about it. We don't have a comprehension or a brain space for what it will be like. But that's our hope. That's the end of it all. That evil will be judged and destroyed. All that is good remains in the presence of our gracious and glorious God. Allow the reality of the return of Christ and His judgment to spur you on to labor well now and take comfort that all that is old will pass away and the new will come.